Well, we're coming to the book of Matthew, and uh, there will be many accidents in my preaching as well. So, you know, as, uh, there's accidents in everything. So we're thankful that we can come to God with the spontane- spontaneity of our worship. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 9, and we are investigating the very concept of what it means that Jesus said, uh, we're not to put new wine in old wineskin. It's a very, very interesting teaching that Jesus has for us here. Let's read Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 to 17. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Sometimes in life, we're to replace rather than to try to fix. There are a list of things, as I looked on the internet this past week, things that you should replace rather than fixing. First, microwaves. You probably want to replace the microwave instead of fixing it. Reason being that if it breaks, it probably costs you more to hire a person to come and fix your microwave than for you to just get a brand new microwave. So microwaves, it's probably best for you to replace rather than fix. Second, car parts, whether you are replacing a car part or having someone built it in into your car for you, it's probably best that you're not getting a used part or a part that's been rebuilt. I had to learn this the difficult way. In a time in my life, I was driving a beat-up 1991 Corolla, and the transmission was going out, and I had someone rebuild my transmission only to have it break down three months later. So car parts, probably best to get something new. Third, TVs. I don't think I ever successfully repaired a TV. If it breaks, if it's showing different colors, it's time for a brand new TV. Fourth, clothing. Clothing is not as expensive as it was in the past. If it breaks or if it rips, at least for the stuff that I wear, I probably just throw it away and get a brand new one. Fifth, hot water heater. Hot water heater. You probably don't want to fix a hot water heater if it breaks. If it's bro- broken or if it breaks, it's leaking water. And if you have a hot water heater in your home, it's going to make your home flood. You probably want to get a brand new water heater if your old water heater breaks. There are things in life that you are better off replacing than fixing, knowing that the very thing which you're fixing will have problems later. Even if you replace them, chances are they will also have problems a few years later because things of this world are constantly breaking. Not just microwaves, not just car parts, not just clothing, not just hot water heater, but the world itself is a broken world. When we think about how the world is broken, there are various things in this world which we could see already that are brokennesses. Brokenness such as murder, such as war, such as genocide, such as people fighting each other, people hurting each other. There's all kinds of ugliness in this world. And there are policies trying to be or enacted, seeking for them to fix the problems of this world. Different policies have been enacted. Different leaders 
have been voted in, different people groups have been called in together to talk to each other and try to form some kind of agreement or some kind of a treaty so that these problems can be eliminated. To a degree, they may be for a season of time, but only to have different problems occur later on in history. We know that this world is broken, and no matter how hard we try to fix it, even though problems can be temporarily fixed, but eventually other problems will come up. What we're looking for as Christians, as those who are looking forward to a better hope, isn't a temporary fix. We're looking for an eternal fix, a fix that will last for all of eternity, in which righteousness will dwell, justice will be upheld. And that perfect world cannot be in this world without God. God is the reason why there will be righteousness. God is the reason why there will be justice in this world. There's a promise for us in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, saying that there is going to be a child who is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, the promise of God is this, that he will bring about justice. He will bring about righteousness. He will bring about that perfect world in which all the sins of this world, whether it be wars and genocide and hurt and all kinds of problems which we have will be eliminated, but that will not come unless Jesus sits on the throne. And so in the book of Matthew, what we're finding out is Jesus is here. He is here. He's sitting on the throne. He's seeking to proclaim himself as king, and he is king. But what shall we do? Shall we receive him or should we reject him? That is the question which Matthew is laying out for us. For those of us who understand and see Jesus as Lord, as one who reigns, as one who is coming to reign, we will receive him. In fact, we will abandon any notion of trying in our own effort to bring salvation to ourselves through our good works. The world cannot be fixed in a permanent way through our good works, but the world can only be fixed through Christ. Our lives cannot be fixed through our own good works. Our lives can only be fixed through the very salvation which Jesus Christ provides. And so uh, here in the book of Matthew, Matthew is seeking to instruct us in this way. If you know this, if you believe this, you would abandon all and follow Christ. You will abandon all and follow Christ. We've seen two categories of people who have abandoned all. We've seen the apostles. We've seen the fishermen, disciples, abandoning all to follow Christ. We saw a couple of weeks ago Matthew, who abandoned all and followed Christ. Today, what we're going to see are the disciples of John the Baptist. They must also abandon all to follow Christ, but their abandonment isn't money. Their abandonment isn't possessions. Their abandonment isn't their jobs. Their abandonment is their rote religious rituals, their traditions. They must abandon that as well in order to come to Christ. You see, throughout the book of Matthew, what we have been seeing is Jesus proclaiming himself as the one who provides salvation for us. In Matthew chapter 5, we already saw that the heart attitude which you must have in coming to Christ Jesus is this. You must be poor in spirit. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, you must hunger and thirst after God's righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, you must be meek. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 
5, and you must be mourning over your sins in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. You must have these attitudes before God. And the reason why you will have these attitudes before God is because you cannot bring about your own salvation. You are a person who is sinner before God. You fall short of the glory of God in your life. So therefore, you need Christ. Christ promised this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And given the fact that he fulfilled it, that means that he's fulfilling it, not for himself, but for you and for me. He has fulfilled the righteousness of God for you and for me, and that righteousness avails for us when we plead before him that he will give his righteousness for us. For this reason, we're humbled before God. We're meek before God. We're mourning before God. We're poor in spirit before God. And we saw people who are willing to embrace Jesus on his terms. And these are the fishermen disciples. The fishermen disciples met Jesus. They heard Jesus. They knew what Jesus was all about. And when Jesus talked to them or called them in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 to 20, saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What happened is that immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. But not just the fishermen disciples, what we're finding out are other disciples, namely Matthew. This is the person we saw a couple of weeks ago. Matthew also abandoned all. He was a tax collector, a very wealthy one perhaps. He was the one who collected the import-export tax because he was stationed along the Sea of Galilee. Jesus met him while Jesus was walking alongside the Sea of Galilee. But for Matthew, he had a spiritual encounter. Maybe prior to knowing Christ, maybe prior to this spiritual revelation, he enjoyed his job. But then we also know that in those times, tax collectors were viewed as a sinner. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 9, they were compared to glutton and drunkards, sinners which are in the bottom of the society, and perhaps Matthew began to feel sad about that discouraged about that. He began to feel a need in his own life to embrace God as God has called him to embrace him. The money didn't matter anymore. Matthew no longer wanted the money. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10, Solomon says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Matthew likely has learned what Solomon learned. I have all the money in the world, but it no longer satisfies me. So he's looking for something else. He's looking for spiritual fulfillment. And when Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 and verse 4, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew heard this likely as Jesus taught in the Capernaum region. And when Jesus said to him in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, follow me, immediately Matthew also followed Jesus. So you have these two groups of people, the fishermen disciples who abandon all their jobs, their security, what they knew all their lives in terms of what they're good at, they abandoned that to follow Christ because they believe that Jesus has a solution to the problem, the deepest problem of their lives, which is sin, and the deepest problem of the world, which is sin. They knew that Jesus is the Messiah who is promised. Matthew also abandoned all. He abandoned his very well-paying job for Christ. But there's a third category of people which we're going to find today who must also abandon what they're comfortable with initially to embrace something which they do not yet know, but is true, and that is the disciples of John the Baptist. In this verse 14, we see of them. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? 
but your disciples do not fast. So here are the disciples of John the Baptist. Who are they? And what are they about? Why they're asking Jesus this question? In order for us to find out more and understand what the context of these questions is and why Jesus answered the way he did, we must know more about John the Baptist. As we know, John the Baptist was one who was proclaimed the very Christ who is to come. John the Baptist's job, as people asked him, was this. In John chapter 1, verse 23, he said to them, when people asked him, who are you? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So John the Baptist's job is due to do what the prophet Isaiah said, which is to make straight the way of the Lord. But what does that mean? Well, Isaiah said this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 to 5. And this is the job of the proclaimer of Christ, the herald of Christ, the one who presents Christ. There's a voice that cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, that even ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That is the full description, full description of the job description of John the Baptist. He is to present Christ. He is to make the way straight. He is to make the way even, so that when Christ comes after him, Christ will have a smooth coming. That is the goal of John the Baptist. Of course, all that is metaphorical. All that is spiritual. Jesus is going to walk on valleys and mountains. This is talking about Christ being presented to the people in a spiritual way, which would reveal to the people that he is the Messiah. And John the Baptist, his job is to make sure that happens. And he did do so because in John chapter 1, verse 35 to 37, when Jesus was walking by John the Baptist, and John was standing with the two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. He's recognizing that Jesus is the very Messiah, the Lamb of God who is to take away the sins of the world. And when the disciples heard him, they followed Jesus. These two disciples likely were John and Andrew. Eventually, Andrew went and got Peter, and John perhaps went and got James and and that's how this fisherman disciple group occurred under Jesus. They were originally following John the Baptist, but John the Baptist was pointing out to them that Jesus is the Messiah, and with that, these four fishermen disciples begin to follow Christ. As Jesus' ministry grows, as Jesus now is in ministry, what we found out is that more and more people are moving toward Jesus and not necessarily toward John the Baptist. And when people heard about this, when people saw this, they asked John the Baptist these words in John chapter 3, verse 30. What do you think? More people are going to him. But John the Baptist answered, He must increase, but I must decrease. It is good that more and more people are going to Jesus because this is the way that it ought to be. He is the Messiah, and I'm only the presenter. I'm only the herald of the Messiah, and I'm glad that he is increasing, and I'm decreasing. I must fade in light of the glory of Christ. And that was his ministry. His entire ministry is to prepare for Christ's coming. He started out before Jesus, and he presented Christ. But his ministry did not last long after he presented Christ because what we found out is that shortly after, he was imprisoned by Herod, or Herod, actually. Herod, who was the king, the Edomite king, over the land of Israel at the time. And Herod had a problem, or had a sin, which John the Baptist pointed out, which is that he married his brother's wife, Herodias, which was sin, which was adultery. And John the Baptist pointed that out to show that you shouldn't do this. Now, Herod or Herod 
excuse me, was very, very upset. And Herodias was upset too. So Herod imprisoned John. As Herod imprisoned John, what happens now is what do we do with the disciples of John the Baptist? We know some of them want to follow Jesus. Some of them are with Jesus. Right now, you have Andrew, you have Peter, you have James and John. They're following Jesus, but there were others who did not yet follow Jesus. What about them? What about them? Well, this is where we encounter them. They should follow Jesus, but John the Baptist hadn't had enough time to encourage all his disciples to follow Christ. And now he is in prison. And these disciples do not know what to do. They're following some of the rote rituals, rote religiosity, rote traditions in our part as far as copying what John the Baptist did, which is fasting. John the Baptist fasted. Why? Because he's looking for the Messiah. But the Messiah is now here. John the Baptist is imprisoned. He had not no opportunity yet, or he had not opportunity yet to tell his disciples, hey, you shouldn't do this anymore because the administration, the times have changed. Jesus is here. We're not waiting for him anymore. He is here. So they come to John the Baptist, or come to Jesus, in verse 14 rather, and said, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Why do we fast? I'm following the rules which John the Baptist set up. Why are we fasting, but you don't fast? Well, we know what fasting is all about. See, fasting scripture is there for a specific reason. There's a reason why we fast. We don't just fast because it's just a nice thing for us to do. Or we must do it when we don't even know the reasons why we do it. Fasting is for the purpose of mourning before God pleading before God, expressing our sorrow before God. That is why we fast. Throughout Scripture, we see people fast all the time. Nehemiah fasted. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. Nehemiah fasted. Why? Because he heard the walls of Jerusalem have broken down. He's sad for the people that they're vulnerable to attacks. He's pleading before God, even wondering if he should go back to Jerusalem to help people rebuild the wall. He's fasting before God. David also fasted. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, he said, They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they have fallen by the sword. This is a sad time for the nation of Israel. Saul had disobeyed God. As a result of disobeying God, he himself was judged by God. Nevertheless, it's a sad day because he was king. He was God's anointed. God judged him. And David mourned for the death of Saul and the death of Jonathan. Another people group that fasted were the Ninevites. Ninevites fasted. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, it says the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Why did the Ninevites fast? It's because Jonah preached a message of gospel, a message mostly of God's judgment. And they fasted before God, thinking and praying that perhaps because of their fast, God will have mercy upon them. And God did. God did. So they fasted in sorrow, in pleading for God's salvation for their lives. You have the Jews that fasted as well. The Jews were going to get killed by a decree which Haman made up. They were in danger in the land of the Persian and the Medes. In Esther chapter 4, verse 3, it says, There was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting that many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. So you have the Jews weeping 
and fasting unto God. Why? Because they pleaded God for God's salvation in this time of great danger. You have Daniel who fasted. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, Daniel said, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by power or by prayer, and pleased for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Why did Daniel fast? It turns out that 70 years of God's judgment is about to end. The reason why they're in captivity in the land of Babylon, eventually the land of the Persian and the Medes, is because they had disobeyed God. For every year they did not let the land lay in Sabbath, meaning that every year they, well, every, that's every seven years they have to do that. And ultimately that's because they disobeyed God in everything they did. God judged them that they shall be in captivity for 70 years. Daniel was counting the days. 70 years is about to pass. God's judgment is about to end. The people of God is about to go back to the land of Israel. So Daniel fasted, seeking God with prayer, pleading before God, saying, God, we're going back. Would you be merciful to us? Would you deliver us? Would you let us come back to the land which you had deemed for us to have. So we see what fasting is all about. Fasting is a heart of mourning and praying before God for God's deliverance in our lives. If you fast today, it's because you are praying and mourning over certain sins or certain situations or sins of this world or even the effect of sin which you see in your own life or in another person's life. You're fasting on behalf of that asking for God's grace and mercy to be displayed in that situation. That is why we fast. The definition of fasting can be seen in Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. God said this, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, he relents over disaster. God is saying through the prophet Job, return to me, mourn, weep, tear your heart, not your garment before me. Come to me with a heart of repentance and with that fasting, and I will give mercy to you. That is what fasting is all about. We're ultimately looking for that restoration, right? Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It is said, these words, that God, specifically Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's ultimately what we're looking for. We're fasting, we're mourning because we're looking forward to God's rescue in our lives. Ultimately, God's final rescue in heaven in which there will be no more sadness, no more mourning, no more tears. We're looking for God's salvation. And so what we see here is this, is that God himself is teaching us what fasting is all about. And John the Baptist actually was practicing this. What or who was he looking for? He was looking forward to Christ. He was fasting because Christ is not here yet. Christ has not yet arrived. He started out his ministry months before Christ and perhaps a year or so before Christ. We don't know, but it was before Christ that John the Baptist started his ministry. In his ministry, he regularly fasted. Why? Because the solution to the problem of sin had not yet arrived. He's pleading before God saying, we see all these problems in the world and in our lives. Where is the solution? God, would you bring about your Messiah as I am called to present him? He's fasting and waiting unto the Lord. But the Messiah did come. And John the Baptist's disciples did not yet realize that. For those who follow Jesus, they realized it. But those who continue to follow John the Baptist, they don't. And when John the Baptist went to prison or jailed, he was not able to continue to instruct his disciples to come and follow Jesus. So some of his disciples came to Jesus 
In verse 14, again I say, they ask Jesus the question, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Well, the reason is because, at Jesus' answer in verse 15, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Why are you fasting? Jesus asked them. He answered their question with a question. Do you know why you're fasting? Are you fasting because you're just simply following the rote rituals of John the Baptist and what he did, not realizing why he did it? Do you actually know why he was fasting? If you know why he was fasting, you would know why we're not fasting. Because the bridegroom is here. The solution is here. The one who brings salvation is here. How can the wedding guests mourn? How can we fast and mourn if I am here? I'm the solution. And so what Jesus is saying to the John the Baptist disciples is this, is that if you continue to fast while I'm here, you're actually acting in disbelief. You're actually acting in disobedience to what John the Baptist has been teaching all this time. You're saying that Messiah is not here. You're looking for another Messiah. But the Messiah is here. So the appropriate action for you to do is actually not to fast, but to join us in eating and drinking because the bridegroom is here. It's not the time to mourn. It's the time to celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ. But there's a day coming. As Jesus said in verse 15, the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. See, Jesus comes, the first coming, to bring forth that salvation in our hearts. The kingdom of God is first established in our hearts. Then Jesus is going to go. As he goes away from us, we are to proclaim the gospel to all nations, and then Jesus will come again. And at that time, he will establish his kingdom physically and visibly on earth where every knee will bow to him. But that moment is going to come in the future. Right now is a time when, as verse 15 says, bridegroom is taken away from them. That's right now. So therefore, we see that the act of fasting or command to fast still exists for us. Yes, we're not fasting when Jesus is here. Well, none of us were here when Jesus was here. But Jesus is not here right now, so it is okay. It's rightful. It's commanded that we should fast right now, regularly for our lives. We actually talked about this when we're going through the topic on fasting. We should be fasting. We should be mourning. We should be looking forward to God's continual deliverance in our lives, eventually his final deliverance when he comes again. Paul fasted in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. It says, in labor and toil, oftentimes in watchings, in hunger and thirst, often in fasting. Paul fasted because he is looking forward to the salvation of God in the people who he is preaching the gospel to. He knows that people's lives are in shambles, that they need salvation. They need Jesus, and they don't have Jesus right now. So as he is going out sharing the gospel, even suffering on behalf of the gospel, he is fasting. Other disciples also fasted in Acts chapter 13, verse 3. After fasting, it says, they prayed and they lay their hands on them, that is Saul and Barnabas, or Paul and Barnabas, and sent them off. They fasted. Why? Because they know that this is going to be a hard journey for Paul and Barnabas. They're going to suffer, and yet it is a necessary journey, missionary journey, that is. So they fasted on behalf of what they are to do, the work which God has given Paul and Barnabas to do, knowing that it's going to be a hard work. In such a way, people fasted. They fasted not because of religious rituals. They fasted not because of religious traditions. They fasted not because this is a rhythm of their lives. They're fasting. Why? Because this is a matter of their spiritual relationship with the Christ who they believe in. This is a lesson for us. How much of our walk with God is based on rituals, on rhythms, on traditions? 
rather than on a vibrant relationship with Him. How much will you do that are based on your thoughts and worship of Jesus Christ? I'm not saying that we're like those monks and nuns. We have to hum certain hum or do certain rituals every day because that's our job or that's what we do. But Christians can get into the mode as well in which we're not really operating on a vibrant relationship as we're filled by the Spirit of God, but instead what we're doing is just rote rituals, checklists off the box. I think there's a time in my life as was a young believer. There's a ritual I adopted, which was helpful for a season, but eventually it was not helpful for me in the later part of my life. And that is the ritual, what we call no Bible, no breakfast. I mean, some of you might do that. I mean, I had to read my Bible before I eat breakfast. That was my, my ritual. That was my discipline. I had to do that. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But eventually what it became for me was that I did not do it out of a heart of love unto God. I did not see the change, right? I did not worship God. I just do it because I had to do it. And there were several times in which I woke up late. If I woke up late, what do I do? Well, I had to eat my breakfast because if not, I'm going to be hungry. But then that means I had to read my Bible. Well, I just read like three seconds of my Bible and then eat my breakfast. I mean, it's cool you read three seconds. Maybe three seconds is better than no seconds. I, I mean, if you're doing it for the glory of God, that's fine. But it became such a ritual for me that I feel guilty if I don't do it, not knowing that God doesn't care about the three seconds of Bible that I read. I can come back after my work is done, after my school is finished, and really spend time worshiping God, being a devotional time with Him, spending time with God, telling Him in prayers the things in my life. I could really, really spend time with Him. But no, I need to squeeze it all before the breakfast time. If I got three seconds, I'm going to squeeze it in three seconds. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, what kind of religious rituals, traditions, rhythms, legalistic actions that you do in your Christian living that you don't have to do, but you're doing it because it's what you do and you feel guilty not doing it, knowing, not knowing actually, that Jesus Christ has already completed your salvation, that you don't have to abide by the things which are a burden to you rather than a blessing. It is said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, 30, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In Christ, we have everything. We already have wisdom. We already have righteousness. We already have sanctification. We already have redemption. That means that your salvation is given to you free and clear. And that God already sees you perfect in Christ Jesus just as you are. He's not mad at you. He's not upset at you when you don't follow these religious rituals. That you have to kind of like treat God like a laundry machine. You have to throw in that coin and the laundry machine then will run. That is not God. You don't have to treat God that way. God loves you, gives to you, provides for you, cares for you. Not on the basis of what you do but on the basis of what Jesus Christ had already done for you. He's given his life for you. You are ready, perfect, redeemed in him. Now, this does not mean that we don't practice spiritual discipline. I'm not throwing out spiritual discipline and saying, oh, that's a burden, don't do it. Or we just kind of go with the flow with everything in our lives. I think it's great that if you do your devotional time in the morning, I do my devotional time in the morning. Most of the time. But if I miss it, I'm not feeling guilty before God. I know that I can come back and read the Bible later on in the day. But we must be spiritually disciplined still. But it's coming from a heart of worship unto God, but not from rote legalism. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, there is a working out. There is an exercise. Literally, this means to exercise out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, do get up. Yes, do go to church. Yes, do read your Bible. Yes, do go to Bible study. Yes, 
pray in regular times and pray a lot. Yes, work out your salvation. doesn't feel good while you're doing it, right? No exercise feels good while you're doing it, but then afterward, you feel pretty good. I read my Bible today. I feel full spiritually. I pray today. I feel full spiritually. I feel I'm learning something in the Word. It's a good feeling afterward, and you're benefiting from it, not being spiritually unfit, but spiritually fit. We're called to be that. But then we also know that we're not doing it from our own strength, right? We're not trying to create that feeling from our own strength. Like, okay, in my ability, I'm going to exercise out my salvation with fear and trembling. No, you don't do that from your own strength. You do that from the strength of the Holy Spirit who is in you, from the heart of worship and gratefulness unto God. That is why Paul later on in the very same chapter in the next verse said in verse 13, for what it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You must recognize that it's not you who is at work in yourself only, but it's God who works in you, empowering you, demonstrating his will in you, and, and his, his purpose is driving you, and, and you're loving him in return, and, and you want this to be more developed in your life, but this is all part of the Spirit's work in you. So you're abandoning rote religious rituals, but you're embracing a vibrant relationship with Christ. And this is what Jesus is teaching here in verse 16 as well. He's going to give us two illustrations, illustration of the garment and also illustration of the wineskin. Verse 16, first of all, is illustration of the garment. He said, no one puts a piece of unstrung cloth on an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and the worst tear is made. So this is something which we could relate to in our days. You have this worn out piece of garment, say a worn out pair of jeans. You wear it quite a bit and you wash it quite a bit and what's going to happen is that that garment, that pair of jeans is going to get really, really thin. And when it gets really thin, it might tear. There's going to be a hole there. But what do you do? Do you cut, a, cut out a, a piece of patch, an unshrunk patch from a good garment and put it on an old garment? Jesus says, no, that's foolish. The patch is going to shrink. If it's unshrunk, it's going to shrink when you first wash it. And when it shrinks, it's going to tear or put stress on other parts of the old garment. Since it's already thin, what's going to happen is that the thin parts of the garment is going to rip. So more rip is going to happen. So no one does this. No one puts a piece of unstrung cloth on an old garment. Another illustration is found in verse 17. Jesus said, neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and skins are destroyed. And so back in the days of Jesus, people made wineskins. And the way you make a wineskin is that you would use the animal, whatever inside animal, for other purposes, but the skin is there, it's left. You take the skin, you turn it inside out, you sew it together, and you create this, this uh, pouch, and the top of the skin is the neck of the animal. That's the bottleneck. And you could actually pour wine inside of it and then seal it. As you seal it, the wine begins to ferment inside the wineskin. We studied this few weeks ago regarding alcohol, right? If you want to ferment alcohol, you would put yeast with, alcohol, with wine or with grape juice at that moment, and then alcohol will begin to form. Alcohol is a byproduct, but also carbon dioxide is a byproduct. And so what you have is alcohol being made, but the wine skin will stretch more because the fermentation gases like carbon dioxide will stretch the wine skin. Of course, with a brand new wineskin, that's okay because the skin is very flexible. It will be able to take that stretch. But as you are using that wineskin more and more, and it's been in the sun, perhaps beaten by the sun, and it's there, what you find is that the wineskin become crusty or old or not flexible anymore. It's okay to use that wine skin for old wine because old wine already has fermented. It's not going to ferment even more. You can pour old wine in there and 
That's okay. But new wine is going to start to ferment. You put some yeast in there and some wine in there or some, some uh, grape juice in there, and it's going to ferment into wine. It's going to create a lot of gas. So Jesus says, hey, if you put new wine into old wine skin, which is not able to take that stretching effort which the wine is producing on the wine skin, what's going to happen is that you're going to burst your old wine skin and you also are going to lose your wine. Now, Jesus is not just teaching us about clothing, how to patch up clothing, nor is he teaching us about wineskins, because even though Jesus knows about these things, Jesus actually is using these two very well-known human experiences as illustration for us in terms of what happens to us spiritually if we do not recognize Christ in our lives and continue on with rote rituals. This is exactly what happened with John the Baptist's disciples. They're continuing on with the rote rituals of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was fasting. They were fasting, continued to fast without realizing a new dispensation, a new administration has arrived. Jesus is here. No longer is there a need to fast anymore. If you have a true relationship with God, you would recognize that. But that true relationship with God means that you must be willing to abandon everything you were comfortable with in the past. If you have that true relationship, to embrace something that is unknown. I talked about it this morning. My dad is coming to salvation. It's becoming it's a miracle for me. I, I literally, I, I do not even understand how this is real. I mean, all my life, right, I'm hearing about him discrediting Christian faith. And now he's saying that all his life he's been looking for something that only God can offer. And he didn't know that until the Spirit of God entered into his life. But he kept saying to me all my life, I'm Chinese. This is a Western idea. I'm Chinese. I don't abide by what you're saying. It doesn't matter if you're Chinese. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, changes you, and he's abandoning all his old ideas, embracing something that he knows is right and true. Even though he is unknown, even though he is not a, a well knowledge of this new thing that he is embracing, but he's willing to. He's waking up early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, just to pray, just to read his Bible. I mean, when you think about that, right? He says, I have to make up all the lost years. I have not known God. I mean, I, I, I don't know how, how this, I mean, of all the things, right? It's like, God, like, this is the miracle of my life. I almost feel like my life is completed. You know, the Lord can take me home. I mean, that's how big of a miracle this is to me. But you see, he must abandon everything that he knew, that he studied, that he thought was true, to embrace something that he knows now is true, but it's unknown to him. But he's willing to find out more and want to embrace that as the foundation of his new life. That is why Jesus said in verse 17, but new wine is put into new fresh wineskin and both are preserved. Do we see this in our lives? I think this is something that we need to realize. There's so many, so many examples of cultural Christianity in our country. People want to add Jesus to whatever it is that they're doing so that Jesus can place their hand and bless it. And that's their version of Christian faith. I think about the American dream, right? American dream is that you work hard and you get lots of money. And once you have lots of money, you can buy the things that you want to buy and enjoy it. And you can be like the fool in Luke chapter 12, eat and drink and be merry. And you don't have to worry about life anymore. That's the American dream. And we want the American dream. We want God, but we also want the American dream, the safety and the security that America or the American dream offers. But Jesus made it really clear, the American dream and the Christian faith do not jive. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, Jesus said, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold 
and will inherit eternal life. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. Leave. If he's calling us, your house, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your children, your lands, for my sake, Jesus says. That is the calling. It's opposite of the American dream. What about other religions? I think about Hinduism. I have Hindu, uh, Hindu missionary friends who go into India to share the gospel there. It's easy just to add Jesus, right? Put Jesus into the old wineskin. We have Vishnu. We have Shiva. We have hundreds of gods. It's okay to put Jesus up there, a statue of Jesus. I mean, we've all seen this, right? Jesus, the statue along with all the other gods in the storm. Like, that's not, that's, that's not a God I believe in. That's not Jesus. There's no power in that statue. Not that there's power in statue anyways, but that's just putting Jesus' rest of the gods. That's, just, that's, that's a demonic thing that you're doing. That's not Jesus. God said clearly in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, to whom will you compare me? That I shall be like him, says the Holy One. There's none like me, says the Lord. None like him. What about Islam? See, it's so easy to just say that Jesus is a prophet. And it's a way of conversation to begin with, I suppose. I mean, when you share the gospel with Muslims, you can say, didn't you or don't you believe that Jesus is a prophet? And they would say, yes, well, let me share with you some of the things that Jesus says. Okay, and maybe the gospel is shared in that way, and God does work in that, but the hardest step for them to take is this, to claim that Jesus is God. They'd rather to have Jesus be in the level of the prophet and believe the words of Jesus, but I cannot acknowledge him as God to the people who I am with, to my family, to my friends. But you see, you cannot put Jesus again in old garment. You cannot put Jesus again in old wineskin. You cannot. He must be his own deal. He is a brand new thing inside and out. As Jesus said in verse 16, no one puts a piece of of unstrung cloth on old garment. Neither, as he said in verse 17, is new wine put into old wineskin. He is all in all. He is the new thing. He is our only Savior. There is no Savior besides him. He said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, he is the only way, and he is the only God. He said again in John chapter 8, verse 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. We must follow Christ totally without serving any other master, whether it be the master of our American dream, the master of our old religious tradition, the master of our own old way of thinking, the master of our old religion, we must abandon that and embrace Jesus totally. Jesus asked for this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. He's talking about money. Yes, you can't serve God and money, but this applies to everything else too as well. You can't serve your old religious rituals, traditions, and serve God at the same time. You can't serve your old thought process and serve God at the same time. You can't serve your old ideology of life and serve God at the same time. There is no salvation in anyone else but Jesus Christ alone. That is the call of the gospel. We're called to believe unto him called to abandon all and follow Christ. We're called to have this vibrant relationship in the Spirit with our Savior. What happened to John the Baptist, his disciples, that is? What happened to the disciples of John the Baptist? 
Well, we don't read much about them here. This conversation sort of ended here. But they do pick up. They are on the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 14, there's a story about them. And the story was that John the Baptist was just beheaded. John the Baptist has spoken truth with Herod. But Herodias did not like John the Baptist and with trickery had John the Baptist killed and had his head on a platter. John the Baptist has now passed away. His disciples must make a decision regarding what they will do now. So the first thing they did was this. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 12, he says, his disciples came and took the body and buried it. They buried John the Baptist. I think this is a fitting ending to their following of this great man, John the Baptist. A conclusion, a resolution to the faithfulness to this ministry. But that's not the only thing they did. After that, in verse 12 says, they went and they told Jesus. And I think this means something. It means that they told Jesus what had happened. They told Jesus what they did. And that telling, they're waiting unto the Lord to tell them what they must do, which I'm sure the instructions that they too now must follow Christ. And I think they did. John the Baptist's disciples followed Jesus faithfully at the end. They listened to Jesus, abandoned the rote rituals and followed Christ, and abandoned this vibrant relationship with God. Will we do the same as well? What stands before you and God? What two masters do you serve? We can only serve one master, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful that we are able to look through this passage to understand, Lord, that we simply cannot put an old garment on or old, uh, put on new garment, rather new patch on an old garment and new wine in old wineskin. They do not fit. So we pray, Father, that we will abandon everything that we know in the past to work for us if it's human origin, if it's human wisdom alone, Lord, we don't need that anymore. What we need is Christ Jesus as one who instructs us with everything in our lives. Help us, God, to take that step of faith and to come to you Lord, with full commitment to you. We thank you. We love you. Help us to show that love more and more each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.